Well, good morning, everyone. Um, let me remind you that the open session, as Rudy said, of this council meeting is being webcast live and is now our routine. The open session of all of our council meetings are videotaped and also made available as a permanent archive on the web, and that includes videos of all the presentations and also various associated documents. And specifically for my director's report, for anyone new to our council meeting, including people coming in uh, remotely, I want to make you aware there's an electronic resource associated with my director's report as analogous to a supplemental materials often associated with published papers, and you can access it at the convenient URL shown on the slide. And the slides that I'm uh, actually showing in this director's report are also available electronically, uh, both as a PDF and also as a PowerPoint file. And for slides that are associated with a specific uh, document or also pointing to relevant websites, there's a document number indicated in the bottom right of the slide, which then references the materials that you can access on this website. In addition to the video archive I mentioned earlier, this web page itself and all linked documents will be permanently archived on NHGRI's website, genome.gov, as a permanent historic um, uh, archive. Well, there will be multiple other presentations during the open session of this council meeting. And my director's report is going to be tailored around those presentations, and I won't be going into any detail those topics that others are going to uh, cover. Uh, following my director's report, we'll have a presentation by Richard Nakamura, who is the recently appointed director of the NIH Center for Scientific Review. Uh, later today, Council Member Bob Nussbaum will present the recent recommendations issued by the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, ACMG, regarding the reporting of incidental findings. And we will then hear reports from two recent NHGRI meetings. Uh, Council Member Pamela Sankar will discuss the first meeting of the Genomics and Society Working Group, and Betty Graham will discuss a recent workshop about NHGRI's training and career development programs. Uh, we will then have uh, one program update and one concept clearance uh, from NHGRI staff members. Adam Felsenfeld will give an update about the genome sequencing program with an emphasis on a strategic proposal of, for that program that's called Disease 2020. And Lisa Brooks will then present a concept clearance uh, currently entitled Interpreting Variants in Non-Coding Regions of the Genome. Uh, for the rest of my director's report, I'll cover the seven er areas that are listed here. Uh, these areas I found to provide a very good framework for reviewing the relevant topics, and we will start uh, with some general NHGRI updates. Um, believing that it's always nice uh, to start a meeting with a feel-good topic, um, April 14th, uh, 2003 marked the 10th anniversary of the completion of the Human Genome Project. Uh, this milestone was met with some excellent press coverage, um, including an interview of yours truly in the New York Times, but also other coverage including stories in the Huffington Post, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, NBC News Online, Health Day, and the San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, the 10th anniversary of the Human Genome Project did not go unnoticed by Congress. On DNA Day, April 25th, Congresswoman Louise Slaughter of New York and Congressman Michael Burgess of Texas, together with some of their House colleagues, introduced House Resolution 180, recognizing the 10th anniversary of the completion of the Human Genome Project. And the resolution praised the sequencing of the human genome as one of the most significant scientific accomplishments of the past 100 years and recognized the ongoing public education efforts in genomics. As you may recall, to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the Human Genome Project, NHGRI held a series of paired seminars beginning in February and also a day-long symposium last month. The last of the pair seminars was held on March 6, which featured Carolyn Lehrman and Alexandra Shields in a pair of talks together entitled Translating Pharmacogenetics Research to Practice, the Case Example of Smoking Cessation. Then on April 25th, DNA Day 2013, NHGRI held a day-long symposium on the NIH campus with participating speakers listed on the right side of this poster. On the all-star cast included council members David Kingsley and David Williams as well as Sarah Tishkoff, Claire Frazier, Jeff Botkin, Kevin Davies, Nancy Cox, Ewan Bernie, Levi Garraway, Dan Roden, David Botstein, and Francis Collins. It, it really was a truly outstanding day. And uh, for those of you who were not there in person, all of these events, both the All Day Symposium and also the paired seminars I told you about earlier, were all videotaped and are now all available on the Genome TV channel of YouTube, one designated specifically for all these uh, celebratory talks. 
And of course, the really novel component of our year-long 2013 celebration of genomics will be the exhibition that we are co-developing with our good friends and colleagues at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. After much anticipation and an extraordinary amount of work, uh, the 2,900-square-foot exhibition entitled Genome Unlocking Life's Code will open at the National Museum of Natural History in June. Also planned is a significant amount of associated programming and outreach in terms of genomics literacy and education programs. And the exhibition will be resident in Washington, D.C. for just over one year until about September of 2014, and then it will tour North America for an additional four to five years. So just for fun, shown here is a bird's eye preview of the exhibition, which will be located in Hall 23 on the second floor of the museum immediately adjacent to the Hope Diamond. Uh, the exhibition uh, will consist of five major thematic areas uh, that are all shown here. Each of the areas will contain engaging interactives and interesting stories that will highlight various aspects of the thematic topic. The exhibition will include stories about our health, cancer, genetic testing, personalized medicine, comparative genomics, ancestry, and the ethical, legal, and social implications of genomics. And with 7 million people visiting the National Museum of Natural History each year, of which over 4 million visit the Hope Diamond immediately <laughs> next door, um, we anticipate that a very large number of individuals will benefit from this incredibly creative and instructive exposure to genomics, and we look forward to every council member coming and visiting the ex exhibition uh, multiple times, and perhaps seeing it in your city when it travels close to you. Well, to complement uh, the physical exhibition, NHGRI and the National Museum of Natural History and the Smithsonian Associates have partnered to develop a series of educational programs for the public, lectures, symposia, discussion panels, and gatherings that will be offered from September 2013 uh, through July of 2014. A few themes that will be covered in the series are listed here, and as you can see, they'll be covering a range of interesting topics, and we look forward to engaging public on these and other important issues. Um, the first of these public programs will be held on September 12th in partnership with the National Museum of Natural History and the National African American History and Culture Museum. This event will explore the role of genomics and ancestry in understanding health, culture, and history. A panel discussion will follow with members of the scientific community and the audience. Of note, NHGRI is providing funding to support an ASHG scientific roundtable on genetic in inference and ancestry, which will be held September 10th and 11th. And speakers from that roundtable event will then participate in the public program on September 12th. While additional information on the other public programs will be forthcoming as details uh, become available. Finally, NHGRI and the National Museum of Natural History are creating a website to promote, feature, and centralize materials related to the exhibition and uh, other relevant public outreach efforts. The website will include a virtual tour of the exhibition, a dynamic timeline on the history of genomics, a calendar of ongoing programs, an educator's guide, and many other resources. It will also offer insights into many of the exhibition's topics, as well as information on basic genetics and genomics. With the URL of www.unlockinglivescode.org, the website will be updated regularly as the exhibition travels. And I should, finally, I, I should point out that none of this, uh, none of this, the exhibition, the website, or the associated program would not have been possible uh, without the generous contributions of many companies, organizations, and individuals. And I want to give a special thanks to the Foundation for NIH which spearheaded those fundraising efforts and were also terrific partners to work with on this project. You will see the full list of those contributors and partners when you visit the exhibition or the exhibition's website. Moving on, um, one of NHGRI's seven divisions, the Division of Management, is responsible for all aspects of administrative management at the Institute, and the director of that division is also known as the Institute's Executive Officer. Uh, Janice Mullaney, who had served for over five years in this position, recently left NHGRI to become the executive officer at the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, NCATS. Until a permanent executive officer and director of the Division of Management is launched and completed, I've asked Ellen Rothes to serve in this role in an acting capacity. Ellen has been at NHGRI for over 16 years and has served as the Institute's deputy director for three years. The other major personnel updates relate to important ongoing NHGRI recruitments. 
I recently launched the search to identify a director for the Division of Genomics and Society, one of the four divisions that constitutes the NHGRI Extramural Research Program. Recall that NHGRI Deputy Director Mark Geyer is currently serving as the acting director of this division. This position will be advertised through USA Jobs from May 22nd to June 4th. Second, uh, we aim to expand the number of program directors responsible for the bioinformatics research activities in the extramural research program. We will soon be advertising for two such program director positions, and in fact, I just got an email this morning to say that those ads will open up next week. Um, and so, uh, important, if you know people, please point them our way. And finally, two of our divisions, the Division of Genomic Medicine of the Extramural Research Program, and also the Division of Policy, Communications, and Education, are actively looking to recruit physicians or other senior healthcare professionals to serve various roles in their respective divisions. Well, now some information about each of these recruitments is available as document five, uh, but as I just mentioned, one of the links won't become available until next year, next week. But meanwhile, if you have any idea of prospective candidates for any of these positions or questions about any of these important recruitments, uh, please feel free to email me uh, directly. Okay, moving on to general NIH updates. Uh, John Lorch has been uh, selected to be the next director of the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, NIGMS. He comes to the NIH from Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, where he is professor in the Department of Biophysics and Biophysical Chemistry. His research group developed a fully reconstituted yeast translation initiation system and used it to dissect the molecular mechanisms of each stage of the process. John will assume the NIGMS directorship in August. In the meantime, I can tell you I'm meeting with him regularly to discuss the many topics of mutual interest to our institutes. I fully expect those discussions will lead to some important and productive new interactions. And I also expect that we will have John come to make a presentation to this council uh, probably in early 2014. Last month, President Obama announced the brain research through advancing innovative neurotechnologies or another, otherwise known as the BRAIN initiative. BRAIN is part of a new presidential focus aimed at revolutionary understanding of the human brain. The BRAIN initiative is now associated with $100 million in the President's proposed fiscal year 2014 budget. $40 million will come from the NIH to develop new tools, training, and opportunities and other resources. An additional $50 million will come from DARPA for understanding the dynamic functions of the brain and demonstrating breakthrough applications and $20 million will come from NSF for supporting research that spans physical, biological, social, and behavioral sciences. NIH has established a high-level working group co-chaired by Corey Bargman of Rockefeller University and William Newsom of Stanford University to define the scientific goals for NIH's investment and to develop a multi-year scientific plan for achieving <laughs> these goals, uh, including timetables, milestones, and cost estimates. The past few months have brought steady progress on the big data and data science front at the NIH level. Recall that last June, a working group of the advisory committee to the NIH director, which included two members of this council, made a series of recommendations for NIH to tackle the big data problem faced by the biomedical research community. There are three major elements in those recommendations. First, a new leadership position reporting directly to the NIH director has been created called the Associate Director for Data Science. This person will be NIH's strategic and programmatic leader in data science, broadly defined. On an interim basis, I am serving as the Acting Associate Director for Data Science. Second, Francis Collins has convened a Scientific Data Council, which is a high-level internal NIH group that will now oversee and coordinate NIH data science activities. This group is now meeting regularly and has significant responsibilities for overseeing NI trans-NIH data science initiatives and for long-term strategic planning in this area. And finally, and in a highly overlapping conceptually with the other two elements, the new Big Data to Knowledge Initiative, or BD2K, is reaching a mature stage in terms of planning. Let me now provide you more details about the first and the third of these three elements. Well, in addition to serving as the Acting Associate Director for Data Science, I'm also co-chairing the search committee to identify the first permanent Associate Director for Data Science. Shown here is the advertisement associated with that search. Last week was actually the initial cutoff date for applications, and those received to date will be evaluated by the search committee shortly. However, the search will remain open 
until the position is filled. So if you know of potential candidates, please send them my way or send me their names and I will contact them directly. It's a very important search for NIH and for the broad field of computational biology, bioinformatics, data science, et cetera. And so the search committee is working very hard to find the most outstanding candidates possible. The flagship component of NIH's big data efforts is BD2K, which is a trans-NIH effort designed to be transformational, catalytic, and synergistic. BD2K's overarching goal is by the end of the decade enable a quantum leap in the ability of the biomedical research enterprise to maximize the value of the growing volume and complexity of biomedical data. It's a huge task, but there's strong support for it across the NIH, including an agreed-upon plan that ramps up to over $100 million of funding per year within a few years and then goes through fiscal year 2020. NHGRI's uh, Deputy Director Mark Geyer is leading the planning efforts for BD2K, with the working group he directs having about 125 NIH staff members, and those individuals come from 24, 24 institutes, centers, and several other offices. Well, planning for BD2K will take place throughout this fiscal year with the launching of some of the initial elements starting in fiscal year 2014. And we expect that NHGRI will end up leading some of the elements of the program and as such will likely be bringing specific BD2K components to this council for your input. Let me just briefly remind you of the four programmatic areas of BD2K. Area one is facilitating broad use of biomedical big data. This covers policies that encourage data sharing and also ways to make shared data easier to find and use. Area two is developing and disseminating analysis methods and software for biomedical big data. This involves developing software, making software easier to find, and making it easier to use, um, especially software for analyzing large data sets. Area three is enhancing training for biomedical big data. This covers both improvements in the existing educational framework and training for existing scientists. And area four, establishing centers of excellence for biomedical big data. These centers will address major biologically driven big data problems. In summary, extensive planning for BD2K is well underway. In terms of a timeline, there will be a series of BD2K planning workshops beginning this summer, and initiative funding will start in fiscal year 14. This program has a unique funding model with funds coming from both the NIH Common Fund and also from all institutes and centers with the institute center support increasing each year and then with common fund support going away completely by around 2020. Well, we're all gratified that despite tight budgets, the collective NIH leadership has identified both common fund monies and institute center monies that will allow the initiative to grow from 27 million in fiscal 2014 to 99 million by fiscal year 2016. And while those available funds for the next three fiscal years shown in green on this slide, are less than those originally requested due to the obvious overall budget constraints, these amounts are still sufficient for initiating a strong problem, a strong program, and we're very grateful uh, that we're able to launch this uh, on schedule. Turning then um, to the broader set of budgetary issues and constraints, uh, when we last met in February, the federal government was at that time being funded by a continuing resolution through the end of March. Congress has now passed a year-long continuing resolution that would keep the NIH operating for the rest of fiscal year 2013 at fiscal year 2012 levels. However, the other significant development was the much-talked-about sequester that was implemented because Congress failed to act before the March deadline. Therefore, as required by the Budget Control Act of 2011, our budget was reduced by 5.1 percent due to the sequester. Because of all the complexities of the sequester combined with the continuing resolution, there was then an additional 0.7 percent cut to the NIH budget, so the overall reduction is actually 5.8 percent relative to fiscal year 2012. So at the end of the day, NHGRI's final fiscal year 2013 budget is lower by about 5.8 percent compared to last year for a, a total of $483 million. This is obviously an incredibly challenging time for us as we now move forward in implementing such a 5.8 percent reduction. With respect to our extramural research program, last week we posted our 2013 funding policy on our website. One important element of that policy is a 4.5 percent reduction to non-competing awards consistent with the NIH-wide policy. 
And meanwhile, competing awards are being examined on a case-by-case -case basis. Well, uh, needless to say, uh, we find ourselves in one of the most unusual and unfortunate budgetary circumstances in a long, long time. Things are particularly bad this year, but this comes at the end of a multi-year trend of decreasing budgets. For example, relative to our specific budgets and other economic metrics, the purchasing power with our research dollars has dropped something like 20 percent over the last decade. Well, rather than standing by and watching the political gladiators battle for higher NIH budgets, some of us at NHGRI continue to explore creative options for funding our important genomics research. Some ideas that have bubbled up from the rank and file include raising funds by NHGRI car washes <laughs> or possibly NHGRI bake sales. I mean, Mark Geyer makes a really mean humantashen. I'm sure we can make a lot of money off that. But I would say that I, however, think that desperate times call for desperate moves by desperate institute directors. I am one of those. I think to raise money to fund our genomics research, we need to move beyond high school type fundraising activities like car washes and bake sales and use the power of the web and YouTube. So along those lines, I note that my director's report at every council meeting is videotaped and featured on Genome TV channel of YouTube, and many, many, many people watch these videos. I also note that my laptop gets prominent viewing during those videos, giving great exposure to the VIO label and to Sony. Now, why should Sony benefit from that exposure? Why not have NHGRI benefit by selling advertisement space on my laptop? So my solution is as follows, <laughs> to do this, okay? Rent advertisement space on my laptop, looks great, and, and have people phone in to be able to get that space for the next director's report. Don't you think that'll solve it? Okay. All right. Had to inject a little bit of humor to otherwise <laughs> gloomy uh, budgetary forecasts, so I will move on now. So fiscal year 2014. <laughs> Well, now the fiscal year 2013 budget has been finalized, the focus moves to fiscal year 2014. Accordingly, on April 10th, President Obama sent his proposed fiscal year 2014 budget to Congress for their consideration. It includes $31.3 billion budget for NIH and $517 million budget for NHGRI. Well, Congress is now starting to examine the proposed budget through Appropriations Committee hearings. Uh, last month, Secretary Sebelius testified before the House and the Senate Appropriations Subcommittees charged with drafting the budget for the Department of Health and Human Services. And last week, Francis Collins and a subset of institute directors testified before the same Senate subcommittee. Uh, to be really candid, at this point, it is too early to predict whether the appropriations bills emerging from the House and Senate will match the President's request. I'll keep you posted. I think it is very difficult to know right now where we are heading uh, with this fiscal year's appropriations. One positive development to report uh, re that relates to the U.S. Congress occurred two weeks ago when a bipartisan delegation uh, from the U.S. House of Representatives visited the NIH. House Majority Leader Eric Cantor led the delegation, and he was joined by eight other members from both sides of the aisle including two physicians, one veterinarian, a nurse, and a clinical psychologist. I was able to join Francis Collins and a few other institute and center directors in meeting with the delegation. For many of the members, it was their first visit to the NIH campus. So Francis gave an overview of NIH to, for, before opening up the discussion. Uh, the members raised a number of important issues, including the effects of sequestration on research funding and the appropriate level of indirect costs, as one set of questions. Uh, the meeting was, it was actually very cordial. Uh, the delegation uh, unanimously expressed great support for NIH. I'd point out that the House member speaking um, in the photo on the, on, the, on the bottom right is Congressman Andy Harris of Maryland, who is the only member of the Congress who has ever had an NIH grant. Dr. Harris is an anesthesiologist um, who was previously a physician scientist at Johns Hopkins University and is very interested in what's going on at NIH, and we had a very good set of discussions with him, and many meetings have and will continue to take place um, with Dr. Harris. Uh, during the visit, members also visited Dr. Lou Stout's Cancer Genomics Laboratory, where they also heard about work going on as part of the TCGA program. One particular proposal within the President's fiscal year 2014 budget that has garnered a fair amount of attention is a plan to significantly restructure federal science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, commonly known as STEM, education programs. Over the past 10 years, a series of reports have expressed concern over the large number of federal STEM programs and, the rec and recommended better coordination among agencies. 
The President's fiscal year 2014 budget responds to those reports by proposing a reorganization of federal STEM education program funding to promote strategic coordination and investment in education activities. Those activities are proposed to be focused through just three agencies going forward, the Department of Education, the National Science Foundation, and the Smithsonian Institution. As part of this realignment, nine federal agencies are scheduled to terminate 78 programs, including nine at NIH. The President's proposal will provide an additional $100 million to the Department of Education to improve K-12 instruction, another $25 million to the Smithsonian Institution to develop infrastructure to support K-12 instruction and engagement, and $51 million to the National Science Foundation to support STEM undergraduate education and development of a national strategy for fellowships. There will certainly be an extensive amount of discussion and debate about this proposal in the weeks and months to come, and we are certainly going to follow that discussion. So let me move now on to some general genomics updates. Um, Francis Frank Ruddle passed away in March. He was one of the first scientists to produce a transgenic mammal, a mouse. He was also one of the first researchers to map genes to specific chromosomes, laying some important groundwork uh, for the Human Genome Project. Francois Jacob, a research partner of Jacques Monod, passed away in April. He shared the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for discovering that cells can switch on and off certain genetic information through regulatory genes. The new Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences has been, has been awarded to 11 scientists. This new prize is sponsored by Genetech's Art Levinson, Google's Sergey Brin, 23andMe's Anne Wojcicki, Facebook's Mark Zucker, Berg and Priscilla Chen, and Yuri Milner, the founder of Mail.ru Group. The first set of winners include some very uh, familiar names to NHGRI, including David Botstein, Tisha DeLange, Eric Lander, Charles Sawyer, and Bert Vogelstein. Congratulations to all of them. And recently, a number of individuals with ties to NHGRI were elected to the National Academy of Sciences. That list includes Jeff Buka, Marcus Feldman, Mihal George, Mary Lindstrom, Norbert Paramone, Stephen Quake, Lou Stout, who I mentioned earlier, Hunt Willard, and Fred Winston. And the same holds true for some recently elected fellows of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, AAAS. That, leaves, that list includes David Allshuler, Marty Blazer, Eugene Koonin, John Liss, Jim Lupsky, and Jonathan Pritchard. And finally, a number of individuals with ties to NHGRI were recently selected as new investigators in the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. That list includes Joanne He, Vamsi Mutha, Avriv Regev, and David Reich. Moving on, the lawsuit over Myriad Genetics BRCA1 gene patents and possibly gene patents altogether is heading towards a final resolution. The case began in 2009 when several pathology societies, clinical pathologists, and breast cancer patients challenged the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, Myriad Genetics Incorporated, and the directors of the University of Utah Research Foundation over Myriad's BRCA1 and BRCA2 related patents. After working its way through the lower courts, the U.S. Supreme Court heard arguments in the case on April 15th. I was uh, actually fortunate enough to attend those arguments as a guest of the U.S. Solicitor General, whom I had helped to, to brief in preparation for his argument. Shown here is the line of individuals that morning. I took this picture uh, waiting in front of the Supreme Court, some of which had lined up the night before to, get, to be able to get in to hear the arguments. Um, and then here is a photo of uh, me along with Francis Collins, Eric Lander, Bob Cook Deegan, and some of Bob's students at Duke, some of them were the ones camping out in front of the Supreme Court, um, on the steps of the Supreme Court. After the hearing, I would sum up my reaction to being there for this important event in five words. It was interesting, it was amazing, it was historic, but it was also surreal, and it was incredibly frustrating, uh, especially with respect to how quickly it all happened, like about an hour and 10 minutes, and that was it. And that made it frustrating, I thought. Uh, the court is expected to issue their ruling by the end of June. Um, it's difficult to speculate on how they will rule. Uh, but most analysts are suggesting the court will agree with the U.S. government position, finding that isolated but otherwise unmodified human genes should not be patent eligible, but allowing cDNA patents to, uh, patent claims to, to remain. 
Um, I've, I've asked Council Member Artie Rye, uh, who's not here today, but was at, uh, there at the Supreme Court in person, I've asked her to discuss the court's decision, since they'll come out this summer, at our September Council meeting. So we'll have a discussion about that at September Council meeting. As more of the Affordable Care Act is being implemented, we are keeping an eye on what it means for the implementation of genomic medicine. Recently, a joint FAQ uh, was issued by the Department of Labor, the Department of Health and Human Services, and the Department of the Treasury, claiming or clarifying that BRCA testing is covered by the Affordable Care Act. Under the Act, certain health care plans are required to cover for no charge preventative services that are recommended by the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force. However, there was a question as to whether that task force recommendations for BRCA testing covered the testing itself or only the genetic counseling services. The agencies have now clarified that the recommendation covers both BRCA testing and genetic counseling, if appropriate for a woman as determined by her health care provider. Associated with this, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force is now working to update its BRCA testing recommendations and recently issued an updated draft for public comment. Late in February, the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, ACMG, and the American Academy of Pediatrics, AAP, released a joint policy statement on the issues related to genetic testing and screening in children. This statement represents an update of the previous policy recommendations by ACMG and AAP from 1995 and 2001, respectively. This new statement emphasizes that decisions about testing and screening should be made with the interest of the child paramount. It expresses strong support for newborn screening, but opposes routine carrier testing that would not provide health benefits in childhood, and similarly recommends deferring predictive genetic testing for adult onset conditions. The recommendations were published in the journal Pediatrics with a more detailed discussion in a complementary paper in the journal Genetics and Medicine. A few weeks after issuing the joint statement with the AAP, the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, ACMG, published recommendations for reporting incidental findings that arise from clinical exome and genome sequencing, building on their 2012 points to consider in the clinical application of genomic sequencing. Among the authors of the recommendations are a pair of council members, Amy McGuire, Bob Nussbaum, Les Biesecker, chief of the Genetic Disease Research Branch and NHGRI's Intramural Research Program, was co-chair of the working group that developed these recommendations. And you'll be hearing more about these recommendations from Council Member Bob Nussbaum later in the open session. In other professional society news, the American Medical Association, AMA, published a white paper on personalized medicine in February. The paper recognizes how genomics will influence the practice of medicine and highlights the need for important policy questions to be addressed in order for genomic medicine to be realized. The paper also expresses the position of the AMA on, on a range of policy issues, including the call to strengthen privacy and protections against genetic discrimination. It also affirms AMA's strong support for the NIH Genetic Testing Registry. A new journal titled Molecular Genetics and Genomic Medicine was launched last fall, with the first issue released last month. Max Munka, chief of the Medical Genetics Branch and NHGRI's Intramural Research Program, is the new journal's founding editor. Molecular Genetics and Genomic Medicine is one of Wiley's open access journals and will publish research in all areas of human, medical, and molecular genetics and genomics. NHGRI continues to feature uh, Genome Advance of the Month on our website, genome.gov. Publications that were featured since the last council meeting described encoding information in DNA, DNA editing in human cells using the Cas9 nuclease, and engineering zinc fingers to target cells. Turning to my regular genomics in the news section, in case you missed it, I want to point out the value of genomics as receiving recognition at the highest levels. In his 2013 State of the Union address, President Obama directly refer to the economic impact of the Human Genome Project in support of continued federal biomedical research investments, citing the 2011 Battelle Report that provided evidence for a 140 to 1 return on investment from the Human Genome Project. As an aside, I understand that Battelle will be updating their economic impact report this year with figures um, for 2012 and 2013. The anticipated release for that new report is in June. Also in the news, the application of genomic technologies for prenatal DNA sequencing was named 
as one of the top 10 breakthrough technologies of 2013 by MIT Technology Review. And as always, there have been a number of genomes sequenced that have garnered recent press attention. These include reports about the platyfish, the ah uh, lemur, the sea lamprey, coelacanth, zebrafish, the Chinese softshell turtle, and the green sea turtle. Uh, there continues to be some mutterings about the sequencing of the Sasquatch genome, although none of this has yet to be substantiated. I just mention it for those interested. Okay, moving on then to NHGRI's extramural research program and starting uh, with the flagship component of our, uh, our genome sequencing program, that being the large-scale genome sequencing analysis centers, who are involved in undertaking a number of projects mostly related to complex disease and cancer. In the most recent quarter, the three centers produced over 100 terabases of sequence, the equivalent of 1,000 high-coverage whole human genome sequences, or about 13,500 whole exome sequences. This pace puts them on track to increase production by 25 percent compared to last year. At the centers, there are over 200 ongoing projects focused on cancer, complex disease, rare diseases, and comparative sequencing. Meanwhile, these groups together have over 25 papers either published or in press in the past quarter alone. Among, among the major efforts being pursued by our large centers is the Thousand Genomes Project. Sequencing is now complete for the Thousand Genomes Project, with data now having been generated for 26 different populations. These data reflect the following. For 2,683 samples, there will be low coverage, 3x or higher, whole genome sequence. For 2,658 samples, there will be whole exome sequence. For 2,642 samples, there will be both whole exome and low coverage whole genome sequence. And for 465 samples, there will be deep whole genome sequence generated by complete genomics, including about 150 children in trios with parents sequenced by other parts of the project. A thousand genomes analysis meeting was held two weeks ago at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory genome biology meeting, during which plans were finalized for analyzing this last data set. And the next 1,000 Genomes Analysis meeting will take place prior to the American Society of Human Genetics annual meeting in October. The Cancer Genome Atlas program continues to generate prodigious amounts of data and publish groundbreaking papers. TCGA investigators met in Seattle earlier this month to discuss the analysis of the over 8,000 samples from 26 types of cancer, with all the data being made available on the TCGA portal. The TCGA network has had three major papers that were recently published or are now in press. On May 1st, a description of the genomic and epigenomic landscape of acute myeloid leukemia, work led by Tim Lay and Council Member Rick Wilson at Washington University, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. On the same day, the TCGA paper on endometrial carcinoma, work led by Doug Levine at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and Elaine Martis at Washington University, was published in Nature. And the TCGA paper on renal clear cell carcinoma, work led by Richard Gibbs and Chad Crichton at Baylor College of Medicine, has been accepted for publication and will be out next month. Uh, for interest, uh, one particular thing to illustrate, the CIRCOS plot shown here illustrate the discovery power of TCGA. Shown are all of the gene fusions observed in the 200 tumor samples analyzed for the, the acute myeloid leukemia project. In-frame gene fusions are shown in green and out-of-frame uh, fusions in orange. Although, although gene fusions have been studied in AML for many years, of the 128 fusions revealed by the TCGA study, 71, that's more than half, had not been reported previously. Another component of NHGRI's genome sequencing program, the Centers for Mendelian Genomics at the University of Washington, Yale, and then the Combined Center at Baylor Hopkins, aim to elucidate the molecular basis for as many Mendelian disorders as possible by genome sequencing. With respect to disease gene discovery, to date more than 9,000 whole exome sequences have entered production pipelines for studying 526 Mendelian disorders involving all major organ systems. And to date, 64 disease genes and 116 candidate disease genes have been identified, providing insights into new pathways, mechanisms, and models of inheritance. In terms of collaborations and outreach, these three centers collaborate with researchers worldwide to solicit samples and disseminate methods. 
So far, they've worked with 323 investigators from 189 institutions in 30 countries, and they've given over 100 presentations about the program. The centers had their first face-to-face -face meeting in March. A new working group was formed to focus on data analysis. They also discussed potential new collaborations, especially with the three large-scale genome sequencing and analysis centers. Relevant to our Centers for Mendelian Genomics program, the International Rare Diseases Research Consortium was launched in April of 2011. This consortium aims, by the year 2020, to develop a diagnostic test for most rare disorders and new treatments for 200 rare disorders. The consortium is governed by an executive committee, three scientific committees, and a number of working groups. NHGRI is represented on the executive committee. Jane P Peterson previously, but now Jeff Schloss has taken over to represent us on that committee. Mike Bombshed of the Coordinating Center for the Center for Mendelian Genomics is co-chair of the Diagnostic Committee, which focuses on solving rare diseases and genome-wide diagnostic sequencing. The first scientific meeting of the consortium took place in Dublin in April, at which Mike Bombshed made a presentation about the Centers for Mendelian Genomics program. And then the consortium organized a panel discussion at the 2013 Bio-International Convention in Chicago, and um, NHGRI Program Director Lu Wang participated in that panel and discussed the Centers for Mendelian Genomics program. Another component of NHGRI's genome sequencing program, the Genome Sequencing Informatics Tools, or GSIT program, has adopted the name iSeq Tools as part of its public outreach effort. This program, comprised of six projects, is developing methods to provide access to sequence analysis tools for the community of users outside of large centers. The iSeq Tools projects are hosting workshops to help users learn how to apply improved tools for sequence analysis. Uh, the next workshop will be July 9th and 10th at the Broad Institute, where users will work with the popular Genome Analysis Toolkit, uh, GATK package. As further outreach, uh, the GATK group supports a forum where registered users can join live Q&A sessions that are designed for questions that are too complex for online support. Last month, 150 scientists participated in the annual grantee meeting for NHGRI's $1,000 Genome Technology Development Program, in which grantees shared their results and were then joined on the last day by non-grantees working in the field. The most striking results reported include demonstrations by several groups for methods for direct reading of modified cytosines in genomic DNA, fabrication of solid-state nanopore rays, and as a spin-out of experiments to sequence DNA using nanopores, early demonstrations of protein analysis using nanopores. A new set of grant applications for this program will be discussed in the closed session of this Council meeting. Moving on to ENCODE, the goal of Encyclopedia of DNA Elements or ENCODE project is to create a catalog of all functional elements in the genome and make that catalog freely available as a resource to the biomedical research community. A widely attended, actually I was there, a standing room only tutorial on using ENCODE data to understand the role of genetic variation in human disease was held at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Biology of Genomes meeting two weeks ago. An ENCODE consortium meeting will take place later this month at which the data production centers, data analysis and coordination centers, computational analysis groups, and technology development groups will all present updates on their projects, begin to develop coordinated analysis plans and finalize consortium goals and policies. And meanwhile, cross-species integrative analyses of functional elements is well underway with manuscripts submitted or in final preparations, and both MOD ENCODE and MOUSE ENCODE are also writing sets of companion papers to go with the major papers. Uh, Mike Pazin, uh, one of ENCODE's program directors, gave a talk about ENCODE at TEDMED 2013 held at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. in April. The talk was entitled, Can an Orchestra of Scientists Find the Hidden Music in Your DNA? And it shed light on how collaborators can help unlock more DNA secrets with experiences in the ENCODE project used as examples. NHRI would also like to congratulate Rebecca Loden and Julie Wexler, two former ENCODE program analysts who were each awarded an NSF Graduate Research Fellowship. Rebecca is currently a graduate student at Washington University, and Judy is a graduate student at UC Davis. Following Council's agreement in February to renew the Centers of Excellence in Genomic Science, SEGS program 
NHGRI and NIMH published a new program announcement in April with modifications that broadened the scope of the SEX program so it became better aligned with NHGRI's new strategic plan. Letters of intent for SEGS and their associated diversity, diversity action plans are due in June and applications are then due in July. The current program announcement is for one year. Later this year, we will issue a new program announcement for three more SEGS uh, application receipt dates. This is because NIH is making a transition to electronic submission of these more complex grant applications. This year's annual SEGS grantee and uh, diversity action plan DAP meeting will be hosted by the SEGS at the Medical College of Wisconsin and the University of Wisconsin. It will be held in Madison, Wisconsin in October and shown here as a group photograph from a previous such meeting. During the first quarter of 2013, the Phoenix Toolkit, an online resource of standard phenotypic and environmental exposure measures, met an exciting milestone, the 1,000th registered user. At the end of April, there are now close to 1,100 registered users. In addition, seven new funding opportunity announcements, FOAs, that strongly recommend the use of Phoenix measures were published in 2013 for a total of 35 um, such FOAs from a variety of NIH institutes and centers. And lastly, the NIH recently launched a web portal to improve access to information about NIH-supported common data element initiatives, such as Phoenix, and to assist investigators with tools and resources for developing protocols for data collection. NHGRI program staff participates in this trans-NIH effort in which Phoenix measures have had a very strong presence. You may recall the Genetic Association Information Network, or GAIN, was established to investigate the genetic basis of common diseases by creating a network of six collaborative genome-wide association studies, include those studying ADHD, depression, type 1 diabetes, and other conditions. Since making GAIN study available through dbGaP in 2007, the GAIN Data Access Committee has received and reviewed over 1,000 project requests. In April, a commentary describing the experience of the GAIN Data Access Committee was published in the American Journal of Human Genetics. Over five years of experience with this controlled data access model have, that's demonstrated substantial use of GAIN data by investigators from academic, nonprofit, and for-profit institutions with relatively few policy violations. As you can see from this table, um, which was included in the commentary, roughly 200 project requests have been submitted to the GAIN Data Access Committee in each of the past several years, with the majority being approved. The availability of GAIN data has allowed for advances of both understanding the genetic underpinnings of specific diseases and the development and refinement of statistical methods for identifying genetic and environmental factors related to complex common diseases. The NHGRI uh, GWAS catalog identifies, curates, and disseminates data from the published GWAS literature in a user-friendly, downloadable resource. Recently, the iconic GWAS ideogram was updated to include studies from 2012. In addition to the snapshot of, at our genome.gov site, an interactive and enhanced version of this graphic can be found on the EBI website shown here. Zooming in on a region of chromosome 16, for example, and clicking on this orange dot at 16Q12, for example, shows information about the association of the FTO locus with type 2 diabetes. Also at this website, there are now graphics customized for the most common and popular searches of the catalog. For example, if you want to search a catalog for obesity, such as that shown here, and these have been generated and are conveniently available for download. The Population Architecture Using Genomics and Epidemiology PAGE program focuses on elucidating the genetic variants underlying a wide range of common diseases and traits in large, ethnically diverse cohorts. Recently, PAGE completed metabochip genotyping of over 60,000 non-European participants, making this one of the largest, if not the largest, collections of well-phenotyped diverse ancestry participants, and analyses and over 20 diseases or traits are, are now underway. And in recent months, uh, Page has published several papers on obesity and diabetes and lipids, as shown by this flurry of, of, of screenshots from some of these papers. The Phenotype Genotype Integrator, or Figini, 
is, is an NCBI NHGRI collaboration to integrate GWAS data from the NHGRI GWAS catalog and dbGaP with other genomic resources at NCBI. This resource has been introduced to Council previously, but here we provide a few updates of interest. The search specific ideogram is now available in a high resolution and downloadable format to facilitate use in posters, papers, and talks. A Fijini overview paper by Ramos et al. is now in press at the European Journal of Human Genetics. And finally, Fijini was honored as a silver medallion poster at the recent AMIA Summit on Translational Bioinformatics. The first set of genomic medicine pilot demonstration projects were awarded on May 1st. You can see uh, the four award recipients here. The goals of the program are to develop best practices for, the, for incorporating genomic information into healthcare settings with the program including new and ongoing genomic medicine projects. The consortium will hold its first steering committee meeting in July, and the reissued RFA for the program has been released with applications uh, due in July as well. Uh, you may recall that NHGRI's Genomic Medicine Working Group held its fourth genomic medicine meeting um, this past January, and representatives from 10 different professional societies across a range of disciplines, as well as representatives from two regulatory bodies, attended the meeting. One of the outcomes of the meeting was the creation of an Inner Society Coordinating Committee for Practitioner Education and Genomics, or ISCC PEG. The goal of this new group is to facilitate professional societies' efforts in educating physicians and other practitioners in the use of genomic medicine in clinical care. The committee is anticipated to include one representative from each interested professional society and NIH institute and center. We currently have representation from 13 medical professional societies and 11 NIH institutes and centers. And the committee expects to hold its first in-person meeting uh, next month. Turning then to our ethical, legal, and social implications, LC research program, the Return of Results Consortium and the Clinical Sequencing Exploratory Research um, CSER program will hold their second joint meeting on uh, May 22nd and 23rd, that's later this week. The meeting will bring together investigators from CSER as well as the R01, R21, and other independent projects funded by the LC research program related to return of results. The meeting will include a wide range of topics of interest to both CSER and the return of results consortium members, including the recent ACMG recommendations on return of incidental findings, legal issues related to liability, as well as the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Act, CLIA, and implications of recent findings on identifiability of genomic data for data sharing. In the fall of last year, NHGRI established the Genomics and Society Working Group as a working group of this council. The mission of the Genomics and Society Working Group is to provide advice to council and to NHGRI on short and long-term, long-range planning and priority setting for genomics and society activities in the institute, broadly defined, with particular emphasis on the LC research program. The first meeting of this working group was held in April, and they are planning for their next meeting coming up in the fall. Um, but Pamela Sankar is going to give you more details on a report about the first meeting of this working group uh, later in the open session. Uh, similarly, earlier this year, NHGRI invited 20 experts in genomics, genomic medicine, and training to a workshop that discussed the future of NHGRI's training and career development programs. This was actually the first review of NHGRI's training program since the Human Genome Project began, and yet the needs in training and career development have changed substantially over the last two decades. Well, with the publication of NHGRI's new strategic plan in 2011, there is a need to assess and realign the Institute's training and career development programs. The expected outcome of this workshop and subsequent discussions will likely be new FOAs for NHGRI training programs, um, but I'm going to leave that discussion to Betty Graham who later in the open session um, is going to be giving a presentation about our recent workshop and some of our thinking around the recommendations. So that's what I wanted to say about our extramural research program. Let me now move to the NIH Common Fund, where, as always, NHGRI is heavily involved. Let's start with one of the oldest of the Common Fund programs that we were involved with, the Molecular Libraries Program. The Molecular Libraries Program offers researchers access to the screening capacity needed to identify small molecules that can be optimized as chemical probes 
to study the functions of genes, cells, and biochemical pathways in health and disease. Chemical probes may also be used to validate new targets. The program began as a pilot in 2004 to develop screening centers, and then the probe production phase then began in 2008. But support for the Common Fund is going to end in May of 2014, so we really are now in the final year of the production phase of this program. Several achievements have been made over the past five years of the production phase. These include the initiation of 352 probe discovery projects and the completion of 340 high-throughput screens and the production of 348 small molecule probes. Uh, the Molecular Libraries Program screening data is available in PubChem for every project and probes are published in the NCBI bookshelf. The next common fund project to mention is, is the Knockout Mouse Phenotyping Project, COMP2. The goal of COMP2, which was launched in the fall of 2011, is to make and phenotype 2,500 knockout mouse strains over, the, over five years. The phenotype data will be deposited into Central Core Database, and the mouse strains will be available from the COMP repository. The project is part of the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium, IP, IMPC, whose overall goal is to make over 5,000 strains during these five years. These graphs show a typical report coming out of COMP2. The top graph shows ES cell microinjections, while the bottom graph shows the production of mouse strains for which the ES cell has transmitted through to the germline. The yellow line reflects the project's goals. The blue line shows the actual production. The COMP2 annual meeting was held a few weeks ago at which overall progress at the international level was reviewed by the IMPC panel of scientific consultants. And finally, the Bloomsbury report on mouse embryo phenotyping was published in March. This presented the rationale for the embryonic lethal phenotyping supplement that was recently granted for over nine point, or roughly $9.6 million by the NIH Common Fund. The Genotype Tissue Expression, GTEx project of the Common Fund, aims to study human gene expression and regulation of multiple tissues through genomic analyses of rapid autopsy samples. The goal is to gain um, insights into the mechanisms of gene regulation and in the future its disease-related perturbations. GTEx released its pilot data in April through dbGaP. This includes genotype data from 182 postmortem donors and over 1,800 RNA-seq studies from 38 different tissues. Shown in the figure are data for nine organs with 90 or more samples analyzed. On June 18th, GTEx will hold the first GTEx community meeting in Boston. And finally, there was a robust uh, response to an RFA a design to enhance GTEx with additional molecular assays, and after review in June, these applications will come to the council meeting, or this council meeting, in September. Moving on, the Library of Integrated Network-Based Cellular Signatures, or LINCS, project aims to create a network-based understanding of biology by cataloging changes in gene expression and other cellular processes that occur when cells are exposed to a variety of perturbing agents and by using computational tools to integrate this diverse information into comprehensible view of normal and disease states that can be applied for the development of new biomarkers and therapeutics. In March, a LINX data forum was held at Harvard Medical School. Approximately 150 people attended this forum, and over 90 of which were non-LINX scientists, including 15 representatives from, and researchers from pharma. In addition, 40 people from Europe and Asia attended via a live videocast. The forum showcased the LINCS tools that were released in November and provided interactive hands-on demonstration sessions that allow participants to try out the new tools uh, with expert guidance. The follow-up LINCS VIZBI or VISB meeting afforded an opportunity for LINCS groups to introduce the broader biomedical visualization community to the data visualization and analysis challenges being faced by LINCS. Finally, the NIH Common Fund has approved a phase two for LINCS, which will begin in fiscal year 2014. The Protein Capture Reagents Program is in its third year. The three production centers, one antigen center and two antibody centers, are focused on production of human transcription factor affinity reagents. All seven of these groups were recently subjected uh, to site visits by NIH program staff and external advisors. 
There's been an overall slowdown in production due to a bottleneck in antigen supply and the unforeseen difficulty in providing two different antigen formats to two different antibody production groups. The program staff and the external advisors are working with the centers to solve this bottleneck and to get production back on track. Um, the biennial EU affinomics meeting was held in March. This program is a European Commission funded effort with similar goals as the protein capture reagents program. The two programs are looking to expand their collaborative efforts. And the protein capture reagents program is also in the process of strengthening ties with the European Human Protein Atlas program. And finally, the first affinity reagents emanating from this program have been deposited in public repositories. Moving on to H3 Africa, the Human Heredity and Health in Africa program, which provides funding directly to African institutions to support genomics research, had its second consortium meeting in Ghana last week. I was supposed to attend, but due to uh, mechanical problems on a United airplane, I never got there. But nonetheless, the first day was devoted to a series of working group meetings um, so that these groups could finalize policy recommendations that were then presented to the H3 Africa Steering Committee for revision and enactment. Um, immediately following the H3 Africa meeting, there was a joint meeting with the African Society of Human Genetics, which began on May 19th and then ends today. That the H3 Africa meeting was held back to back with the African Society of Human Genetics meeting was no coincidence and is part of H3 Africa's outreach effort to engage African scientists across the continent. The next H3 African consortium meeting will be held in Johannesburg, South Africa in October and will coincide, coincide with the South African Society for Human Genetics Congress. And the last of the common fund programs to talk about, the Undiagnosed Diseases Network. UDN is being established across the country to increase the capacity for and the use of genome sequencing in the diagnosis of rare and new diseases. The network also hopes to aid in the management strategies for patients with such disorders. The Undiagnosed Diseases Network has two funding opportunities with applications for both due in June. First, the Undiagnosed Diseases Gene Function Research R21 solicitation will support gene function studies to investigate the underlying genetics, biochemistry, and or pathophysiology of newly diagnosed diseases in association with gene variants identified through the Undiagnosed Diseases Network. And Clinical Sites for Undiagnosed Diseases Network, U01 solicitation, aims to add to and build upon the NIH Intramural Research Program's Undiagnosed Diseases Program. This program seeks to provide improved patient access to state-of-the-art diagnostic methods, which will be pursued by expanding the available expertise and facilities serving patients with these unusual disorders and by accelerating discovery and innovation in diagnosing and treating these patients. So moving on um, to our Division of Policy, Communications, and Education, just uh, several updates. In late 2009, NHGRI began distributing its video content on Genome TV, a channel on YouTube.com. Since then, NHGRI has produced and posted more than 630 videos ranging from recorded webcasts of this council meeting to major events such as our recent symposium celebrating the 10th anniversary of the completion of the Human Genome Project. As of April 29th, Genome TV had 5,159 5 subscribers and the videos on Genome TV had been viewed uh, more than 1.1 million times. While you can access all the videos on Genome TV directly through YouTube, We've also conveniently and very recently organized all the Institute's um, Genome TV video assets, assets on our website, specifically at genome.gov backslash genome TV. In the upper right corner of the page, users can also see any live uh, webcasts currently underway. In addition, the broadcast media tab on the lower left of the page links to full resolution, high definition video that news organizations and other broadcasters can download directly and use in their shows. And for historic purposes, the archive video tab in the lower right links to older videos that were produced prior to the middle of 2007. But by creating this page, we're hoping people have one place to land and conveniently see in a very organized way all the different uh, video uh, uh, assets that we have organized uh, around specific areas. I will tell you that I am a big enthusiast of our Genome TV channel. Um, when I travel, especially abroad, people say very nice things about it. And I think our general video-based outreach efforts are important for the Institute to do. But, and one of the reasons for this is that not infrequently 
I, I, I get a feel-good email uh, that just makes me uh, smile all over when I otherwise crazy and stress-filled day. So I just want to share one with you that came. So as anecdotal evidence of Genome TV's outreach, here's an email I received back in March from someone at Lahore College for Women University in Pakistan. This individual asked specific questions about my personal favorite Genome TV video, the one that Carla Easter and I produced demonstrating how to purify strawberry DNA using materials you can find in your kitchen. But the thought of someone in Pakistan watching, being able to watch Carla and I do a laboratory demonstration, figure out how, to, how she might use it and, or he or she might use it and then send me an email with a technical question, just, it just made me smile. It just made me just, and, and again, when I travel abroad, similarly, I have people come up to me, constantly compliment the Institute for all the video resources we make available. Okay, Genomics and Medicine Lecture Series began its third round of lectures earlier this month. Um, the lecture series is a collaboration between NHGRI, Suburban Hospital in Bethesda, and the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine to educate healthcare professionals about the increasing role of genomics in clinical care. This round of lectures will focus on uh, genomics and oncology and will include a special lecture on integration of genomics into nursing practice. Lectures in this series have been held monthly since December 2011 as part of Suburban Hospital's Grand Rounds. Now, the lectures themselves are attended by about 80 to 100 in-person practicing physicians, but all the talks are videotaped and guess what, are made available on the Genome TV channel of YouTube and are being watched widely. And finally, for this division, to celebrate DNA Day 2013 and in partnership with the National Museum of Natural History, NHGRI held a program for over 250 high school students from eight different local schools on April 19th at the National Museum of Natural History. While at the museum, these students listened and participate in a question and answer session with a panel of genomics researchers and were sent on a scavenger hunt throughout the museum, which illustrated how genomics is relevant to many of the current exhibitions at the museum. And students also participated in hands-on genomics activities and concluded their busy day by viewing an IMAX film. And then meanwhile, staff from NHGRI also celebrated DNA Day 2013 in partnership with Megar Evers College, the Brooklyn Public Libraries, and five Brooklyn high schools. As part of the day, students spent two hours isolating DNA from cheek cells and discussed the relevance of ethics, ethical issues in genomics research. And finally, and in winding down, let me just give you a few highlights from NHGRI's intramural research program. Starting out with an award, uh, Elaine Ostrander, chief of the Cancer Genetics Branch and NHGRI's intramural research program received the International Canine Health Lifetime Achievement Award for her leading role in sequencing and analyzing the canine genome and thus providing a lasting legacy for improvement of dog health and the understanding of several human diseases. In terms of another anniversary, NHGRI founded the Social and Behavioral Research Branch almost 10 years ago on December 4, 2003 making it the seventh of NHGRI's branches in its intramural research program. Uh, the branch is planning various elements, elements to, or events uh, to celebrate their 10th anniversary. For example, uh, uh, Dr. Lerman's and Shields' paired lecture that they gave as part of our commemorative activities also served to kick off uh, the celebration of, of the 10th anniversary of the Social and Behavioral Research Branch, um, although then on, in October, a larger celebration is being planned, an event that will include two internationally recognized speakers, NIH colleagues, alumni, trainees, and visiting faculty. There will also be an afternoon exhibition that will include posters and interactive exhibits to showcase innovative science of both intramural and extramural genomics and society programs. And finally, um, some recent highlights from NHGRI's intramural research program include the following. A study by an international research team that included Ellen Sadransky and Tara Wolfsburg reported that people who carry gene alterations that cause Gaucher disease have an elevated risk for Parkinson's <coughs> disease and even, even higher probability for dementia with Lewy bodies. A large study by a consortium that includes Charles Rotimi and members of the Center for Research on Genomics and Global Health identified genomic regions associated with body mass index among people with African ancestry. A team of researchers led by Elaine Ostrander studied dogs with squamous cell carcinoma with a digit and established the genetic cause of the disease. Standard poodles are among those at highest risk, and the condition only affects standard poodles with dark coats. And Jim Mulliken and colleagues at the NIH Intramural Sequencing Center collaborated on a study with researchers at Duke University that can help researchers determine which proteins 
to use investigational vaccines to induce antibodies capable of preventing infection from an array of HIV strains. And with that, I will close with some thanks. Uh, personal thanks to all the NHGRI staff. I estimate at least 50 to 60 of you who helped pull these many slides together that I just covered. I couldn't do this alone. It's totally a group effort, and thank you for helping. And as always, a special thanks to Chris Wetterstrand, who's the ringleader of these uh, slides and coordinating the material and getting them to me um, to produce the final PowerPoint. Uh, this is actually a screen capture from a video trailer um, uh, about the Smithsonian Genomics Exhibition that includes an interview with Chris, who is among the many at NHGRI that has contributed greatly to the exhibition's development. All sorts of videos being produced and will be featured in various ways in the next few months. And also a big thanks to Larry Thompson, Judy Wyatt, and the NHGRI web team for making my director's report into the electronic resource on the web. And with that, I will stop and happy to take any questions. Bob. Eric, so um, I really enjoyed your alternative fundraising approaches. Oh, um, it fell. Yeah. I, I, w I wanted to ask you um, whether uh, there's been some thought of, of um, approaching the PCORI and seeing whether some of the genomics and medicine initiatives that you're interested in doing could be done in collaboration with them. Uh, absolutely. Those, I've joined at least uh, one such meeting. There are many meetings going on uh, that involve the NIH director along those lines. Um, there, you're, there, is tremendous, there is tremendous potential overlap, um, as you rightly point out, not only with what we're doing, but with broadly what one could imagine being done in, in today with some of the scientific opportunities we have today. Absolutely. But I, will, but I would also say that's being driven at the NIH level, not at individual institute levels. I, I think Francis is on the Board of Governors of PCORI, if I uh, I think that's, that sounds right. Yeah. That sounds right. Other? Yeah, I, I've been monitoring your uh, live, yeah, right there, you got it, uh, uh, the, the, the live feed, and that does show up very well. But I also noticed when Bob Newsbaum was talking and it, the, the camera goes over there. So basically, all of these all are of them. potential. We could have little laptop yeah, so covers. Just, uh, yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although I'm looking around council table and there is a heavy enrichment for apples around the council table. So, but that doesn't matter. We can still, we can still come up with our little covers. Okay, back to Rudy. Uh, Richard, is he here? Yeah, he's here. Where's Richard? His presentation Excellent. I will. I sure will. I just. Where's Richard? There. Oh, there you are, Richard. So we have a a, a guest um, that I mentioned earlier would be joining us, and we'll just go right into Richard's presentation. I want to introduce to council Dr. Richard Nakamura, who. Uh, has a long history uh, here at NIH. I can just give you a, some, some brief background about him. He's actually had a 32-year career at the National Institute of Mental Health in various capacities. He joined it actually as early as 1976, a postdoctoral fellow. Um, but over the years, he assumed a number of positions, including being the deputy director of the institute from 1997 to 2007. Um, I got to know Richard, and particularly when he served as the institute's scientific director at a time when I was also the scientific director of this institute. He was their scientific director from 2007 um, until uh, 2011. Um, I also, during that interval, he also served as acting director of NIMH for 2001 to 2002. Um, but then in September of 2011, um, he was asked uh, by uh, Francis Collins to, uh, to move over and become the acting director of the Center for Scientific Review, um, and which he did. And then uh, he also applied to be the permanent director and was selected into that position. Um, and he's been in that role for a number of months now, and I thought it was very, and others, including members of this council, thought it would be wonderful to hear from him directly. Um, and so we asked him to come give an update about about the CSR, Center for Scientific Review, and also give you all a chance to have a conversation with him. So, Richard. 